Welcome to Tent Talk, the podcast with Nancy McCrady, where we talk about life under the big tent of God's presence and the provoking process of discipleship. Here we go. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Tent Talk. This is Nancy McCrady. In these three episodes, we are continuing in Jay Oswald Sanders' classic spiritual leadership, but we're jumping over to chapter eight. I'm going to do the reading of chapter eight and then much commentary on chapter eight on the essential qualities of leadership. So it's important that as you listen to these three, that you do it uh, through the ears and the eyes of the new man and of the new covenant so that it doesn't turn into performance or just the natural qualities that we each have, but that we go deep with him into our life in Christ and let Christ be formed in us so that we will be uh, true leaders, his leaders. So here we go in these three episodes. Love you all. All right, let's see what we can do as we continue with comments. Um, on chapter eight, I thought about, you know, trying to be, you know, quick and moving forward. And, and I thought, why, (laughs) why would I need to rush off? Right. This is the slow fire process of God. So as I have given some thought to this, uh, because, you know, I'm recording these, you know, Wednesdays are typically production day here at NMM, whether I'm producing for YouTube channel, podcast, um, preparation for, you know, schools that we're doing, whatever we may be doing. I attempt to set aside Wednesdays as much as possible to be able to get things done where it's the only thing I focus on. And that is a fight, my friends, even just you know, um, referring back to what we were talking about in our last episode, you have to find your rhythm and lead the life that he's called you to. And there is so much learning in that. Um, And so when you're listening to these, see, I did these a week prior. Uh, And so um, that requires me to uh, think in a certain way, plan in a certain way, also to be willing to be spontaneous, um, no matter how much I've planned, that when something begins to spring up in me and I find I want to hover over something, I, I realize, all right, I, I need to stay with that. Because having a plan is great. But can the Lord move you? Can he stop you? Can he start you? Can he sit you down? Can he stand you up? I don't want to be offensive, but can he, you know, hit your hind parts and and put you out into a gallop, you know, (laughs) right? Right. Because this is the rhythm of leadership is who is leading you. Maybe look at Romans 8, 14 today. Those who are the sons of God are led by the spirit or those who are led by the spirit are the sons right? We're being led by him. We're not wishy-washy. It doesn't mean we're reckless. It doesn't mean we never have a plan, right? No, I have plans, but can they be upended by God, right? Because ultimately he's the one who gives me the overview. And he says, now look here, we're going here and I get some ideas and I begin to talk those through with him, right? And then it kind of all sifts out and then I start to get more clarity, right? Because all of it, all of it requires leaning into him, talking with him, learning how to move with him. And if you find yourself impatient because you're like, how will I ever know all that? Well, by staying and being willing to do exactly what we're talking about here, which is to fail so that you learn how to succeed. You have to be willing to fail to ultimately succeed, my friends. If you can't bear failure, If you can't be a true learner, you're more of a performer and everything has to be just so, you're going to snap, crackle, and pop, let me tell you. 
on your way to real maturity. And so this is all learned. And that's why I don't ever want to, you know, be giving a rote formula. So I myself today, learning, be spontaneous, stay in chapter eight, just stay in the things that he's showing and talking about and, and then pass those on. So I want to refer to uh, the section that I read from in chapter eight uh, that was talking about a particular leader uh, who was very strong and, and uh, you know, was always giving out to others. But at the end of his life, he admitted to one great mistake, was that he had always helped others But he had resisted as diligent as he was to serve others. He was just that diligent in resisting, allowing others to serve him. And as a result, his life had an empty spot where sweet friendship and human care might have been. So many of you have heard me say before, we as believers, as sons, have to be in all things. We must be first world-class receivers if we are going to be world-class givers. If we are going to be, let's say, champions, right, leaders, all of that, you have to first receive. That's why it breaks pride. This way of God's life, the way of his kingdom, will bust pride every time. When he says, you're going to have to come after me, you know, pursuit crucifies pride, receiving crucifies the pride of, you know, that I always serve and I always give. It's like you have to first receive because what what would, what would you have to give if you have not first received of the Father? I only have love for God, for myself and for others as I've allowed God to love me. And my husband and I, we are givers. We love to give. But we have had to learn through many painful seasons, and now, of course, we're very grateful for it. You learn to receive so that uh, your, your giving comes out of the receiving from God. And then to be willing to be receivers uh, of what others are directed by God to pour into you. So there's always that ebb and flow within the kingdom And I just thought that needed to be pointed out. We must always be receivers. And sometimes it takes the power of God just to simply be able to say to someone who wants to give to you to just say, thank you. Thank you for that today. Uh, This just happened to me this morning. Uh, I know you're listening to this a week later or so, but... uh, with someone was just sharing what God was doing in them, that they'd heard from me, right? And I was like, man, this is hitting me today right where I'm at. I need this. And so I sent them that message. And I said, thank you for sharing with me what you heard and uh, what God is speaking to you out of the richness of your life with him. Because it's really encouraging me with right with where I'm at, right? And it was. And, um, you know, this is something that um, makes for a richness of life uh, with him. This section on vision out of chapter 8 is so very, very powerful. And God taught me something in the last six years as NMM has grown and matured as a, as a ministry, um, comes out of the maturing that I have needed to go through. And this statement came in conversations with a dear friend that if God has given you oversight, you're going to have to have foresight. So this became like a, man, I mean, it was like a stake in the ground that I could refer to time and time again. And I was reminded of this as I read this section. In chapter 8, it says on the top of page 56 in my book, Vision involves foresight as well as insight. So this, when you have oversight, my friends, when you're going to have oversight over a work, no no matter the size, whatever the size is, but you have to be up above things 
to be able to have his vantage point and to see as he sees. So you're living based on something that might not yet even be right in front of you. You're thinking ahead. You're tolerating today as you live in the future. And you understand that what you're sowing today is going to bear fruit later. You've heard the old saying, you know, there were people, thank God there were people that planted trees that they were never going to sit under. They planted those trees knowing they would bring shade to their generations, right? That we understand that what we're doing now is going to bear fruit later. And so that comes from a compelling um, vision, a compelling point of view, um, um, something that grips you from within. When Paul would say things like, I've not been disobedient to the heavenly vision, uh, that man saw someone and some things that he was shown by the someone, by God himself, that compelled him from within, that was truer and more real to him than the things that he saw in his everyday life. That's why those things did not move him. And this is definitely going to be what lead sons are going to have to have. Other people may only be able to see what's right in front of them. And in great humility, without any superiority, you're going to have to be able to speak to people in a way that empowers them to get up in the moment and to live greater than the moment, right? So this is so, so, um, so vital. Uh, in one of the, the quotes that he, he brings forward in chapter 8, says, the man of God must declare the pattern that was shown him on the mount. He must utter the vision granted to him upon the Isle of Revelation. I love old writing. <laughs> so on the mountain, what did you see when you were in that high place with God? Now, can you live that out and be led by that when you're down in the valley, when you're down in the muck and the mire, as they would say, right? Because we want to be those who are more compelled by him who is invisible. I mean, this is probably one of my favorite points out of that section on, on vision, because I've referred to it many times. You know, Moses, it says, was not moved by the face of Pharaoh in Hebrews 11. Well, remember, Moses grew up in Pharaoh's house. So, so Moses wasn't moved by the face of his family. M Moses wasn't moved by the face of one who now at that point could, you know, decimate them. It says that he was uh, compelled by him who is invisible, well, to the naked eye. But once you have seen God and you continue to behold him in the spirit, my friends, he will direct you. Your eyes are upon him. You're locked in face to face in an intimate gaze that isn't about some soulish intimacy. It's about an honesty, a, a light that comes from being in his presence. And now everything about you is directed by that. You might forget momentarily, but my friends, more and more and more, you are gripped from within. And we need leaders such as this. That's why the statement uh, that was made there in chapter eight, eyes that look are common, eyes that see are rare. And this to me is so very, very important that we want to be compelled by the face of him who is invisible, that we are in oneness with him. So I want to close out these comments. I'm certain there are other comments I would like to make uh, out of uh, chapter 8, but uh, we will now go into uh, other uh, chapters, possibly out of this book or other things, but we are going to continue uh, in this flow of true leaders, his leaders, uh, and we'll just continue on with him. But I pray that this is encouraging you because he's building you, my friends, for the specific life that you have with him, for this specific hour of history. Don't look about and compare and contrast yourself. You can definitely learn from others. That's why we're here. That's why we're in this together. But it is not so that we are trying to just imitate their specific points. 
we can imitate faith, my friends, like imitate my faith. I have great faith in him. He gave me his faith. He's building that faith, right? So yes, do the same. Let him build that same faith in you that you have, the faith of Christ, and and learn from him, right? So we're encouraged by others that have gone before us, those that we walk with, and we certainly want to pour into those who are coming after us. But we, my friends, are being built into a certain kind of person right now. You're not defined by the tasks that you do. You are defined by him. He made you, new man. Rise up. Let him love you today. Let him lead you. And I pray that these words today are finding um, great openness within you, that they'll bring so much encouragement. So until next time, love you all. For more information on Nancy, please visit nancymccrady.com or follow her on social media at nbmccrady.com.